everybody, I'm Maritza Barone, and this is the Things You Can't Unhear podcast. Has there ever been a moment in your life where you heard or read or were told something that you simply could not unhear? Something that caused you to make positive changes so that you could become the best version of yourself? Well, we share this show with access to inspiring and empowering humans who will motivate you to become the happiest, healthiest, kindest, and most compassionate you. Sit back, settle in, and let this be the day you hear something that simply cannot be unheard. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Things You Can't Unhear. This is episode number 113. And today on the show, we welcome James Colhoun, the founder of the global health movement called Food Matters, along with his partner, Laurentine Tambosch. Now, since helping to heal James's bedridden father from his own personal chronic illness, which completely transformed his life and got him back to great health, James and Laurentine have made it their mission over the past 15 years to empower others with knowledge on how to heal their bodies naturally through their Food Matters platform, which now has a community of over 4 million people. You may already know some of their work through their well-known groundbreaking documentaries called Food Matters, Hungry for Change and Transcendence 1 and 2, which are now being hosted on the renowned Gaia TV network. And if you haven't watched or downloaded Gaia before, please do so. It is incredibly inspirational and insightful. James and Laurentine have also authored multiple books, including a recent cookbook with Hay House, which I am absolutely loving in my own home right now. And they run business and nutrition certification programs to help others to learn and make their own impact. Through the Food Matters platform, they are changing people's lives for the better and have helped countless people heal themselves from chronic illnesses through changing their diet and eating habits and going back to basics when it comes to nutrition. James has a wonderful, insightful and inspiring story and an amazing outlook on life. I hope you enjoy this chat. Welcome to the Things You Can't Unhear podcast. It's nice to be here, Marissa. We're going to talk about a lot of things you can't unhear today, I'm imagining. Okay. (laughs) There's plenty of golden nuggets that have come out of Mm -hmm. you already, and I've only just started to get to know you. So I can't wait to share this with our community and our listeners. So let's take people back to the beginning, and let's start with the why behind what keeps you going and keeps you motivated every single day to get back on the on the you know on the horse and share this important message of yours. Mm. Uh, you know, Maritza, you know, I think people can look at where I'm at now and think, oh, well, maybe he was destined to be like an entrepreneur or to build companies or to make films, but it was nothing like that. I mean, I'm more than anything an accidental impact maker, and it really started with my own family. Um, I was working in a different career which I call my past life and I was working on ships and private yachts and passenger ferries and I didn't I didn't love it I liked it I was getting paid good money I was traveling the world I was mingling with celebrities and billionaires and seeing all these incredible parts of the world from like diving in caves in Mexico to you know, drift diving in the Red Sea to surfing in Oman. And it was sort of like a golden handcuffs because it was so exciting and so beautiful and well paid. And yet it wasn't really lighting my soul up. And I guess I didn't really know what it was that I wanted to do. I just was focusing on what my profession was. And then parallel to that journey, my father was going through his own personal journey. And he'd been in the professional sort of accounting practice and corporate accounting and he was really suffering he was quite unwell and and for five years it was it was like an illness that just slowly got worse it wasn't like this big diagnosis or this big problem he was just too tired to go to work and then couldn't get out of bed and he wasn't feeling well and his medical doctor would say it was chronic fatigue syndrome and then then he started to be put on some medications and he was not doing well in his body he was a little bit overweight he was stressed out a lot you know and he'd come home and he'd often drink and then you'd hear him at night sometimes yelling out names of clients in the middle of the night (laughs) as he was going to bed yeah and and you know this is what we sort of grew up with but it, it was taking a toll on him you know and he had followed the advice of 
of governments and food regulators saying, look, diet soda is good, it's low in sugar. White bread is a fantastic way to start the day and to enjoy the rest of your day with it and transition to white pasta at night. And so he thought he was doing the right thing. And then he was trying to exercise, but he, he wasn't well. He was really unwell. And the medications started to stack up more as he was going through this sort of trying to diagnose this mystery illness. Like chronic fatigue syndrome is something that the medical profession doesn't really know what it is, and they don't really know how to cure it. That's why they call it a syndrome. And so this confused him more. And then as he started to have to eject himself from his business, then he started to suffer the next thing that typically happens for people in midlife or even earlier now for a lot of people which is this identity crisis like well who am I then if I'm not my profession mm. and that started to result in things like depression and then taking medication which potentially resulted in things like anxiety and so he was on six different medications fatigued not sleeping well anxiety depression sometimes the panic attacks were so bad he'd have to go to, to transport to, to care how old was he at this time he was in his 50s yeah you know uh it started in late 40s and then went through to his early 50s and and myself and and, and laurentine my partner we were overseas at the time and we were struggling with ways to help and and it was we felt a little really really challenged by this you know my dad was deteriorating he was not well and he couldn't even stand being in the hometown he he was he grew up in uh or where he built his businesses because he was confronted every day with like oh how are you he's still sick and all these questions about his so he had to he moved country he moved overseas and then at the same time sort of following this path Laurentine and I had stumbled into some seminars and some personal development work and one of the seminars spoke about health and we were like whoa this is so powerful I mean talking about acid alkaline diet and talking about plants and fiber and nutrients and and then the way animals are treated and we were shocked and so we started to make modifications to our diet and started to read some books and then got more and more inspired over time and then ultimately started to study nutrition online and in doing that program in studying nutrition we realized that there were so many ways that we could help my dad and yet he wasn't being offered that from the medical profession and this became this huge in a way aha moment but mm. it was extraordinarily sad here is real solutions that are cheap safe simple and effective that are born of mother nature and they're not being offered to my father and then we saw what was and what we started to uncover was this huge discrepancy in the ethics of healthcare, and so we were just on this huge passionate rampage about wanting to tell my dad everything about nutrition and natural healing and herbs and detoxification and the dangers of all these processed foods you want to share the magic that you've been stumbling across and learning and exactly. digging into exactly but we he couldn't hear us he couldn't hear us because we were not doctors. You know, we were not qualified and his doctor was qualified to help him. And that that annoyed us, you know, because we were trying to help, but we couldn't help him. My mother was on board. She started reading some of the books we were sending, but my father, he was very resistant to this. And then we thought, well, what if we went and interviewed some of the experts we'd been studying, the books we'd been reading, and then take him that knowledge? That could be the the piece that helps him unlock his potential and at least break down the barrier of receiving this knowledge. Mm. Because there were eminently qualified physicians, researchers, naturopaths, uh, journalists that were bringing this to the world. He needed to hear it from someone else. From them, yeah, Yeah. not from us. And so we started to think about that process. I remember we were in the Middle East at the time and then we were on a vessel that was heading back to France and we ordered a lot of film equipment from New York, had it shipped to Monte Carlo, quit our jobs in the Red Sea, I remember going up there and then got back to Europe and started traveling the world for the next sort of year, uh, interviewing all these experts we've been studying. And by the time we got to my father's, which was almost halfway around the world from Europe <laughs> all the way around and through Australia to Fiji, where he was living, I think there was a combination of him thinking that we were crazy um, a, B, that we'd spent most of our life savings <laughs> traveling around the world interviewing these experts, and C, that we had the audacity to sort of 
lob up on his doorstep with this footage to say, hey, we're here to help, this is going to happen. I think that combination sort of made him take us a little more seriously than he'd had in the past. And this resulted in, in a really what, what became a really beautiful story. He, he started watching some of the interviews, the experts that became what originally became our first film, Food Matters, and it just completely cracked his mind open. And I think, Maritza, the, the big thing that happened was that his healing took place, yes, because he eventually changed his diet and we contraband all this food and we put him on this program to detox and he was able to put in all these extra nutrients that he was missing, supplements, and then eventually get off his medications. And he lost 50 pounds, like 25 kilograms, got off all his medications in like three months and has never looked back. Uh, that's after six years of being in a really horrible spot started running again, incredible transformation. But the point, Maritza, where it really happened was where he shifted his belief from the medical profession's gonna help me, I'm this, this unpowerful little person that can't do anything to affect my health, to hearing from some of these experts, in particular Charlotte Gerson, Andrew Saul, etc., that your body has an innate healing capacity. Mm-hmm. And that if you're able to provide this environment where it can support itself and heal itself naturally, then it will do that work. And I think that mindset shift for him was what created the healing in his life. And that then has become our mission for the past 15 or so years in helping shift people's beliefs about what's possible with their health through films, through books, through education and events, and now nutrition study programs and and that's uh and i'm grateful to my dad for that and Mm. we have a beautiful relationship now and and yeah he's he's still here he didn't leave us there was points where it was close he thought about taking his own life you know some of the side effects of these medications are so horrific and we have tens of millions of people taking psychotropic medications ssri antidepressants and anxiety medication We have people with all these mystery illnesses, autoimmune conditions, fatigue, um, you know, brain fog, you know, gut issues that are just not given much hope. And that's not the case. There is a lot of hope and um, there's so much people can do. And that's really driven us to this day to keep providing that information and helping people. Absolutely. You've given him his aha awakening moment around this. You've given so many others, four million plus in your community now who I'm sure you have heard countless stories from, similar stories to what you have helped your dad with. So that is an incredible impact that yourself and Laurentine are driving for every single day. It's funny you talk about this story, actually, because it brings up a very similar story with my mum, who I was probably 15 at the time. She was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. We'd come home from school. We'd find her collapsed in the bathroom horrible like 18 month illness that we couldn't find the answers to exactly like your dad's Mm. story and it must have just been a stroke of luck she tried many doctors I'm sure like your father and there was one particular person who said all right we've tried everything we're not sure how to solve this let's put you on a special candida diet wow lucky this is literally probably 20 years ago now Mm -hmm. And she went on this incredible diet, removed wheat completely from her diet. Yeah. We were having really yummy food. We will never yeah. forget the food that we were eating, actually. Yeah. We, we were using almond flour and buckwheat yeah, and wow. making yummy pancakes and yeah. replacing all of the, the normal flours mm. with new yeah. alternatives. And within maybe six months, she was completely 100% cured, went back to running her business on her feet and full energy back. And I feel as though she struck it lucky, obviously in a huge Mm. way, because back then this wasn't the norm, was it? No, when people thought about natural healing in, you know, what was like 2005, 2003, 2008, that sort of era, it, it... it would conjure up these ideas of somebody in tracksuit pants holding a crystal in their backyard saying, come to me, I've got this special, like, secret natural therapy. And that is because, Maritza, like, a lot of the research around nutrition and natural therapies doesn't make the mainstream because it's not typically funded by the institutions that profit from ill health. And, And this is one of the big things that people are becoming more aware of, but still is a big impediment to so much knowledge reaching people. And that is the fact that the medical 
uh, training institutions like these colleges and universities um, are receiving a lot of funding from the pharmaceutical companies. And the research that goes into these universities and establishments is typically funded by these companies. Um, you have, you know, statistics from you, and this is like five or ten years ago, um, half, a, half a trillion dollars worth of drug sales uh, globally, annually, and 300 billion of that is in the U.S. Um, why? Well, if you look at a macro environment, the U.S. is a, a, a picture of, 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 of the Western developed world, which became addicted to convenience post-World War II, and that resulted in obesity, it resulted in a lot of processed food, it resulted in a lot of stagnation, as we outsourced all the sort of things that kept us busy, like <laughs> growing food and moving around. And, and really, then they also have this unique predicament where they allow drug advertising on television in the US, which is illegal in Australia and, and New Zealand and the UK, but they find ways around it. You know, they do information campaigns and they go speak to your doctor. So I, I feel like it's not the individual that's to blame. We're, we're in a system that is not really geared towards wanting us to be in optimal health. It's geared towards keeping us just sick enough that we can be a customer for life. You know, and I, I feel like this economics discussion around health is, is not very well understood yet. It, you know, we, we were highlighting it in our first film, Food Matters, that came out in 2008. And even t- to this day, you know, many of the experts that I've interviewed and follow are still highlighting information. Like there's oncologists that profit from selling chemotherapy. They should profit from patients being healthy. You know, mm-hmm. in China, you sack your doctor if you're sick. Mm. You know, in the West, we go to a doctor if we're sick, and those doctors are incentivized based on the therapies that they offer, whether or not they're effective. Mm. And they're often paid for by the insurance company. So we have an enormously corrupt healthcare system or disease care system, and that plays against our, our fears, you know, because, oh, quickly, Absolutely. we need to get this done, we need to get this. And then the doctors are fearful that if they don't offer that therapy, they're liable because of the way that insurance is structured. So we're in a very um, unhealthy sort of relationship with healthcare, And people have an enormous opportunity to take their power back, but it requires education. And that's really at the crux of what we exist for at Food Matters and many of the great experts that that are in our space about how can we educate people to become more independent in their thinking and in their decisions on a daily basis to take more control of their health. The body is definitely a very intelligent vessel Mm -hmm. and if we just give it the opportunity to heal itself through these methods that really aren't going to harm us in any way, Mm -hmm. are they? Like they're natural methods of food replacement and, and fueling our bodies. But it's not only the medical system that is the issue here, it's the food industry. Mm. So I want to touch on that a little bit and get your insights into where the food industry is not serving us. Mm-hmm. So I've recently had the opportunity to spend time in in an island nation called Vanuatu, and I know, Maritza, you've spent time in Fiji as well, a, a country that's very dear to my heart. And... In Vanuatu, I spent time on remote islands with tribes that have rarely seen white people and live in in a traditional way. And having spent time with them, it's interesting to sort of dissect their relationship to food and the environment. And I think it speaks to probably what indigenous humans did, you know, thousands of years ago, potentially hundreds of thousands of years ago or more. And they plant food. They're gardener gatherer hunters or hunter gatherer gardeners however you talk about it and they cultivate multiple different plots of land and they also hunt you know for wild fish and and shellfish and crustaceans and mollusks when you look at what they grow most of the species are endemic they exist there and some of them have been imported things like we think about bananas as being local to the pacific but they're not we think about um, cacao chocolate it's not from there Uh, we think about um, corn it's not from there it's from central america so they grow some of those items but for the most part most of the food that comes from there are are endemic there's their species that are that are from there Mm. and that makes up the majority of their diet and you see these people they are the epitome of what a human should look like in a textbook. 
And even there was photos showing of humans in humans, people <laughs> in the like 60s and 70s on the beach in the US. And there were some viral photos going around on the internet recently. And they're, they're trim, they're strong, they're fit, they're healthy. And you look at the photos of people today and they're not. Mm-hmm. You know, a majority of people today statistically are suffering from obesity and um, they're not well. And that is the result of the food system. And here's why. So you take this indigenous person and you look at their diet and you're like, well, okay, 90% of their food is from a species of plant or a vegetable or a herb or a seaweed or a mollusk or a shellfish or a, a wild bird or a bat or something that comes from that area. And they've been eating it. It's not processed. It's natural. Then you look at the Western developed world and we had these meteoric shifts in our thinking around agriculture post World War Two. And you know, in World War Two it was a pretty wild time. And World War One was a wild time. I mean the actual numbers of deaths during World War One is staggering. You know, they were losing per battle hundreds of thousands of troops, millions of lives lost, you know. And we see it as this horrible thing. And then World War Two was this big horrible global event, right? And there was a lot of biological warfare and biological experiments that were happening during World War II. And then post-World War II, when we had to sort of rebuild and and regrow our economies, we started to redistribute this technology into different industries. And a lot of the biological weapons went into agriculture. Mm. And we started to then grow domesticated plant products in mass across broad swathes of the landscape. Things like corn, wheat, and soy. And these are the three main products. Then the government was like, great, well, let's subsidize farmers that do that. And then there was this huge amalgamation of farmland. Then there was less farmers, more automation, and more chemicals. And here is the result of that. We are now consuming corn, wheat, and soy in a multitude of different ways, whether it's a processed ingredient in a nutrition bar, nutrition bar in, 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 in quotation marks, or it's a bun at a fast food restaurant, or it's the meat at that restaurant, which has been fed corn, wheat, and soy. So we've basically gone and created a, a new agricultural system funded by the government, which supports the growing of these products in mass and also indirectly supports the devastation of the biological environment of the soil, which then is flowing down into the Gulf of Mexico, for instance, if we're talking about America, and creating huge dead zones in that area because of the lack of oxygen because of these toxins in that environment. So there's huge knock-on effects in the environment. But ultimately, the effect that it's had on humans is that we're eating more corn, more wheat, and more soy. And these three products are okay in the diet in small amounts if it's the indigenous original plant that hasn't been heavily domesticated. But all of these plants have been heavily domesticated or genetically modified or modified predating genetic modification technology which was more wild and you get more wild outcomes and results in the gene expressions in the plant and so we're eating more of these foods and it's almost inescapable you spoke about your mom she had some crazy amazing integrative physician or naturopath that said hey we need to put you on a candida diet but that was eliminating one food group which is a key villain in this discussion here, which is wheat, Mm. right? So people can experience enormous, you know, uptick in their health and their potential as a human species by eliminating some of these three heavily domesticated foods. And that is really at the crux of the problem, Maritza, is that these three foods, these three foodstuffs, should I say, have permeated themselves into our landscape and even into our food pyramid. You look at our food pyramid, down the bottom, it's like wheat products, Mm. grain products, you know. It's almost inescapable. It's inescapable in many ways. And so we were never designed to eat this way. We have, you know, as a species, domesticated grains, you know, in small amounts and eaten them, but we normally soak them, we ferment them, we treat them with respect and love. They're more of these indigenous ancient type grains, but now we've gone and changed that whole process over the last hundred years, and we are suffering as a result of that. And like I said, even the animal products we're eating are no longer healthy because they're being fed those products as well. So we're making the animals sick that we're eating, the chickens, the the eggs as a result of those chickens, the chicken meat and the organs of those animals, and also the, the, the cattle, for instance. 
they're being fed these products and they're sick, which is why they're on antibiotics and they're confined and they're stressed out. So we're eating sick, stressed out, unhealthy animals, high in omega-9, in pro-inflammatory, uh, high in all these hormones. And then we're having it between two pieces of bread, which is made from wheat, which mm. has been sprayed with like glyphosate just before it's harvested as a desiccant to dry it out, which has all these toxins in it. It's breaking down our gut wall, leaking macro particles into the bloodstream, causing a cascade of autoimmune conditions, which we've never seen so many in the modern world. And then we're obese because corn and wheat raise our blood sugar levels like crazy. Like two slices of whole wheat bread is the equivalent of a couple of tablespoons of sugar, or teaspoons of sugar, should I say, which is about five grams per teaspoon, so it's like 10 grams of sugar. Then we're drinking liquid sugar in the form of high fructose corn syrup from corn. So these three products, Maritza, have caused massive devastation to the modern food landscape and the processed food landscape. And as a result, we are suffering. I think people listening to this may be freaking out if it's the first time that they have heard this or, you know, the first few times they've heard it and wanting to make changes quickly and implement Mm. new techniques into helping our bodies to thrive. And I love that that's what you do at Food Matters. You, You give people the problem, but then you also supply a solution through the content you're creating, the, the cookbooks, the, the sessions, the courses. It's, it's incredible because it can begin to get a bit somber when you do lose a bit of trust in our system as a whole. Yeah whether it be the medical system or the food system. Yeah. And like I said, it's it's inescapable in many ways. What is your solution? I mean, convenience is a big thing. Where do we go first in terms of trying to avoid what mass marketing is thrown at us in many ways? And, I mean, even my children who go to the shops and they see all the bars right in front of them at the checkout and, you know, they're constantly asking and, and they want the McDonald's because it's cool and mm. they're asking for Subway because it's on their TikTok on videos or YouTube. YouTube ad. I saw never, it last night. The or kids Starbucks. Are like, Rami's like, like, oh, that looks so nice. And I'm sitting there going, do you know the and, stuff they're putting in there? But they don't know. And, and, I, and they probably don't even care yet. Mm, they don't care. Yeah. Because you're invincible when you're young. Yeah. Um, look, the, the, the way I, I break down this sort of question into three approaches. If you want a new outcome in your life, which most people listening to this may do at some level, whether they want to be a more effective entrepreneur, a visionary, a mission developer or mission maker, or they want to be a better mother or a father and have the energy to be there to you know, wake up early, do a workout, take their kids surfing, which I happen to do this morning, or they want to improve their body at some level, whether they want to do it just to feel better, they want to lose extra you know, five or 10 kilograms, or they want to get rid of a chronic illness or get off some medication and get rid of some problems. And we, we know that for most people over the age of 35, 40, a high percentage of them suffer from something. It's just statistically the norm. And so the way that I've had sort of transformation broken down for me is that, okay, there is a desired result. I want to heal my leaky gut, correct my thyroid issue, stop my hair falling out, whatever it might be, lose some weight. Then if you come back, that's going to require certain actions that you take on a daily basis. But oftentimes, most people know the actions they need to take, but they're not taking them. Mm -hmm. If I put a piece of paper in front of 100 people and I say, write out the perfect diet plan, most people give it a pretty good go and they'll do quite well. I'll probably give most of them an eight out of 10, right? And then what sits before that though is the, you know, the few you know, inches between your temples, right? Which is your <laughs> mind. And in particular, that part of the back of the brain, which is the sort of limbic brain, which sort of houses most of our subconscious conditioning which is said to be 30,000 times more powerful than our prefrontal cortex and inside that sort of animal limbic brain the subconscious brain is where we are on some sort of autopilot and most of the decisions we make on a daily basis are not from our prefrontal thinking brain but are from our limbic brain or the subconscious brain so we need to think about how do we rewire or instill 
or implant or upload or download new belief systems into that brain so that we automatically make better decisions because I can see it with many people and I have done before and tell them all about healthy eating and they're like, oh my god that's so great and they go home and eat a packet of crisps mm. or they go home and do the same thing they've always done and when they're stressed out they particularly make poorer decisions because when you're stressed out you actually you leach blood from your prefrontal cortex and it goes to other parts of your brain that are like fight flight freeze so we become less intelligent when we're in fear state and the whole mainstream media is designed to put us in fear. Death, pain, fire, destruction, terrorism, COVID. Mm. And then, and war. And when you're in fear, they give you an advertising. In the US, I saw this thing, uh, Joe Rogan shared it. It was like a CNN update on the war in Ukraine. And it was like, dun, 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 you know, this horrible war, blah, blah, blah. And then it cut to an Applebee's ad, which is basically like go and buy like a hot mm. apple pie down the road and mm -hmm. douse it with a big Coca-Cola or some ice cream afterwards. And we'll see you there. You know, it's like whoa we just freak people out and then we tell them to go fill up their bodies with inappropriate food and many people follow that script subconsciously i think you just hit the nail on the head is watching things reading things being in society but with a different awareness mm -hmm. and not taking everything with a grain of salt you start to laugh at it exactly it's, it's laughable i mean to, when you go to america i was there just the other week and, and you see a drug commercial on tv and they start reading out the potential side effects and it lasts for 30 seconds and may cause you know, anal leakage. Do not operate heavy machinery. Could, could result in sudden death. Mm. People need to start getting more curious, <laughs> yeah. right? Not just taking it for granted yeah. uh, and, and just taking it as it is and it's served to us. Exactly. Ask the questions, dig a bit deeper. Mm. You've obviously been Question everything questioning and so digging and exploring. Question everything. I always say that. And or follow the money. As Andrew Saul says, good health makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't make a lot of dollars. Yeah. And so we're re-engineering this, right? So we want an outcome. We need, to, we need to do certain actions, but most people aren't doing those certain actions, even though they want the outcome. And then it comes back to your mind and your beliefs in particular. So how do you shift your beliefs? The main way we shift beliefs is through education. Um, another way we shift beliefs is then taking that education and sort of programming it in, which means either continuing to educate yourself on that topic until it becomes an inherent belief mm -hmm. or certain other processes you can do to, to do that or you can just sort of learn about something and then force yourself to do it for like 21 or 28 days create a new habit and then you get the outcome and you get the sort of habit for life or for a long period of time until the media get you back into fear frustration <laughs> desire stress and then you go back and, re and resort so most of the focus on our work has been on how do we educate people on how to shift their beliefs, which is why we've been big on films. And, you know, we have four films or a series that are available. And we also have now a nutrition education program where people can study nutrition online and become a certified nutrition coach. And by taking your study seriously, by investing in yourself in doing that work, you really implant new belief systems into your body and you're like, wow, actually, I can heal that. I do have the opportunity to bring more balance and homeostasis to my body through these foods, these supplements, these herbs, these essential oils, these activities and exercises or breath work or meditation. And by doing that, I know that that works. I've instilled them as like beliefs in my life and I'm acting on them and then I get the result and that's how people get more sustained results is through continuing education you know and unfortunately the education that we're offered has been outsourced to the media to Facebook to television to um, our governments and they're educating us on what's helping them yeah not in particular what's good for us we do want to remove ourselves from that fear narrative and I think my husband says this to me all the time. He says, educate yourself as much as you can, know what's going on, and then just let it go. Mm -hmm. Let it go so you're not harboring on it and you're not, you're not creating your own fear mm -hmm. around, you know, what, what other industries are doing and what they're, you know, pushing onto us. So I find that very, very useful information. But then there comes the, the mind-body connection. Mm -hmm. So not only are you now keeping your body at its optimum level and it's thriving through food. I'm doing my best, Ruth. And you are. Yourself and Laurentine are picture-perfect health images and, and look amazing. You look strong. You look fit. You look energetic. And, you know, I do want to bring in the other element of mind 
and how the body and the mind connect. So how do you then, now that you've got your body serving you in the best way through food, connect your mind to follow suit? Mm. As I finish a piece of chocolate. Well, it's healthy chocolate. It's healthy it? chocolate. I mean, it's dark <laughs> chocolate with cashew butter. You know, when I, when I think about anything that you experience in your life is a result of your conscious or subconscious actions. And people sometimes take a while to put that together. But when they're in relation with somebody else, an intimate relationship, you know who the subconscious part of you is because they reflect that back to you. Hey, you're an asshole when you do this, or you always do this, and you you don't often see those blind spots. So a partner can be a really powerful coach. And as you start to become more aware of your patterns, and then you look at your mother and your father, and you're like, oh my God, I'm becoming a little bit like them. Then you start to realize the power of the conditioned human. So from, as Bruce Lipton talks about, from third trimester to seven years of age, when we're in that sort of precognitive phase we're, we're very much in an imaginative um, phase of our mental development and we're downloading our environment and so if our parents are fighting a lot or there's divorce or there's struggles about money you know we grow up with those limiting beliefs or and we just we just get conditioned in a certain way and that used to serve us as a species because we would have struggles and the fire would burn, uncle, what's his name? And then we would learn about these things and we would, instead of being taught them in books, we'd be taught them through just the experience of the field coming into us. And so we're very conditioned beings. And as we get older, we start to experience that more in the results in our life, whether you might struggle with money, you might struggle with relationships, or you might struggle with your health. And then you start to go, why? And when you start to ask that question, why, Maritza, it opens Pandora's box and you start to to dig into the mind and then you start to come across people like Bruce Lipton, who I just mentioned, Mm. Joe Dispenza, Mm. um, Artie Wu. Uh, These people have been in our our documentary series Transcendence, uh, season one, some of them, season two, others, uh, Jim Quick, for instance. And then you start to learn that we have an enormous capability to influence our mind, except we don't typically exercise that capability. And then you start to go, well, how do we exercise the capability to take control of the mind so we can have more influence over our environment, the material environment, and also if the material environment doesn't give us what we want, we have more capability to have control over our response, Mm. not our reaction to that. So if something doesn't work out like you want, I love that. You can yeah. be able to sit with it and respond in a certain way as opposed to react and then get into that same sort of fear, flight, freeze, stressed out problem before and you you don't use that opportunity to work through a block that you might have. So there's many practices that you can do to improve your capability to master your mind. And I was fortunate enough early in my journey to be gifted some of these practices which I credit for much of my capability to remain calm and have an impact amidst all sorts of challenges in my life but one of them was I I met a gentleman once who was dressed in all blue a blue beanie, blue glasses blue shirt blue pants, blue socks and blue shoes and he had a blue backpack and he wasn't a smurf no, he was not a Smurf. I used to go to a school, actually, where we dressed in blue and they used to call us Smurfs. So that's funny you mentioned that. And he was not a Smurf. He was a very uh, esteemed business. He was a business gentleman. He was one of the first people. He developed, like, the CD-ROM technology. Oh, wow. He was the first. to then he got into health. And he was the first to bring, like, mangosteen powder to the West, which is an incredible tropical fruit. One of my favorites, actually. I've been eating a lot in Bali, four or five a day. I don't know if that's overdoing <laughs> it, but it was just my, my, my <laughs> little moment. And um, he was working with a spiritual leader. And I think after his sort of material success, he went more into the spiritual path and he was working <laughs> with this Indian guru. And in India, guru, guru just means teacher. And the best gurus are the ones that help you find that you are the guru. You know, and that's really the point of a teacher is to help you realize that you have the golden key 
that the entire universe and all the answers to everything resides within you because even all of these religions or all of these philosophies, all of these beliefs have this same constant common thread which is that you are cut from the same cloth as God as they say, that sort of Catholic type tradition. And he said, oh, James, he was talking to me about these ideas and he said, James, my guru taught me a mantra and he got gifted this mantra from her and he told it to me one day and I immediately adopted it. It just felt like it went straight into me and it became part of my existence. And people that know me know this mantra. Maybe you don't know it yet, Maritza. We haven't known each other very long. But it is. Everything, and I use my fingers so I can use up all five, but remember, everything is absolutely always unfolding perfectly. I love that. Yeah, it's so big. And it just drops you down to... Mm. It's that okay. Calmness. Not fear. Exactly. Yeah. And so this is the antithesis of where the commercial, you know, food, drug, death, pain, fire, destruction, war, COVID sort of world wants us to be in fear as so we go buy stuff. Your teeth aren't white enough. Buy this. You're not getting sex. Spray this on. Mm. You know, your your skin's not the right color. Here, use this tanning thing. And then you go to another country, like, use this whitening soap. You know, all of these things are fear-based. But that doesn't honor the fact that we are divine and that we are almighty, which is the sort of operating system of these ancient Vedic practices, right? So he taught me this mantra. And it's not everything happens for a reason, which you can say is good or bad. And that reason was that because that person was an <laughs> asshole. This is bad. But you can make up anything you want from that. But that everything is absolutely always unfolding perfectly is a whole nother level. And it, it sort of blew my mind. And I really just grabbed that with two horns and I completely integrated that mantra into my life. I would repeat it out loud daily. I would walk and just talk it into my mind. There's this thing you can walk and tap on your fingertips mm. and you can repeat mantras like I love my life or I everything is absolutely always unfolding perfectly. You know, you're drilling this in. You know, you do it after a period of time and then this miraculous thing happens, Maritza. Everything becomes perfect. Mm. And that then puts you in this state of excitement, opportunity, acceptance, peace, love, understanding. The types of energies and emotions that keep you open, aware, alert, calm, connected, grounded, and capable of making sound decisions in life. And this is one way that I was taught to sort of hack my brain. And there's not a day that I, I, I don't say it. In fact, my prayer when Hugo goes to bed and Rangi, we do a little back and forth. I'm like, everything is absolutely always unfolding perfectly. You can achieve anything in your life. Teamwork makes it. It goes on. There's like five minutes of it. It's super cute. It. It's gorgeous. But that's one way that I've been able to hack my mind. Then there's other ways that I do this. And these really do come from ancient traditions because... A lot of modern personal development. I know we had a little side discussion on this the other day. I'm huge fans of like Wayne Dwyer. Tony Robbins has been a big influence in my life. And so, I, you know, all these people are a, a huge in the personal development space and an incredible influence on the world. But where are they getting their information from? And I kept digging and digging and digging and digging and digging and eventually found out that most of the personal development that we see and experience in the West is from the... Vedic tradition, these philosophies teach us that we are divine, mm. that, you know, this concept of God resides within you as you, um, and that to see then love in everybody, which is the golden rule. And the more you can implant these, I feel that the more you start to elevate your consciousness to a point where you become less bought into the facade of the modern world. And you're more bought into the quantum reality. M M Marianne Williamson recently gave a talk at a Gaia event. And she said that we are merging from a Newtonian world, which is a, a physics-based world of material, into more of a quantum energetic world. And quantum physics is teaching us that everything is, is, is energy, not matter. Mm. And that's changing us because we've been in a very material-based focus for a long time. And it's like money, things, stuff... And that's just killing the planet. We're competing for resources. You know, we're jealous. We compare. 
And then there is this whole other world that exists. And Tesla said, if you want to understand the universe, understand energy. And he gave us a clue because basically there is this energetic world through this quantum world. And that quantum world is like, there is total abundance. There is complete everything for all. We're not competing for everything. And we're all in this same sort of cosmic soup experiencing as, as Deepak Chopra would say, where spiritual beings having a human experience. And really, when you start to embody more of these philosophies of an energetic realm, which is taught by these ancient teachers, which is the original personal development, then you start to become, and funnily enough, ideally, a more calm, compassionate, loving, caring, empathetic human being. And you start to build and create and do things from a heart space as well as a head space but more concerned with how to, to make an impact and help lift humanity up mm. and uh, it's been a really interesting journey for me and things like meditation mantra repetition tapping is a sort of modern form of trying to implant scripts and things using sort of the, the idea of ancient sort of meridians energy meridians in the body and modern psychology um, psych K you know, there's a lot of different things you can do and these these things will help you become more familiar with understanding the power of the mind and i would say that is the path ultimately for all humans is to master their their mind we go and master the material world and we master our bodies and the last bastion we leave is the mind because it's the most difficult you know people normally leave it to last but i would sort of try hey why don't we reverse engineer that start with the mind because from there everything else flows and it's a lot easier. So much gold in what you just shared then. And you've obviously got this fountain of knowledge tapped within you through the school of life, probably. Mm, through, through experience, through mm-hmm. reading, picking up books that you're curious about, digging into it further, asking questions, and you can see the passion behind it. I, it brings me to a question, actually. What is a talent of yours that you're not utilising right now? Because I'm hearing all of this come out. Mm. And, and you're the food guy, right? You're usually talking about food yeah, and nutrition. And, and having this conversation with you now, it feels like there's this whole other library and catalogue of information that you're, you've got ready to share with the world. Well, when I, when I think about that question, Ritza, um I, I see that you're leading me down. Well, maybe it's more of that yogic philosophy path. And I am very passionate about that. And I do see... It having a huge impact in the world and I'd love to facilitate in some way that these practices, these ancient practices reaching more people. However, when you say that, I would say music is my latent oh, wow. talent. Yeah, yeah, I've, you know, played in bands when I was a kid and I write music almost weekly. I'll write new music. Uh, I play the guitar and I sing and that's definitely a latent talent that nobody knows about except like a handful of people close to me and I really love music what type of music well I've I used to play in punk rock bands so that's very loud and fast and energetic (laughs) and I've written classical music on like seven string arch top guitars and I'm also like love jazz and I love sort of like pop acoustic chill music and then I love like spiritual relaxing music so I, I don't think I'm a like Reggie Watts, who's an amazing musician, says, I'm not into a genre. I'm into good music. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if it's good, I'm into it, you know? And, um, you know, I love writing. And that's something that I'd love to, to, to do more of. Except maybe I have a limiting belief around it. That mm-hmm. My parents said, well, I remember I was playing in a band and we were starting to get good. We had an album. We are getting some radio play. We are starting to support some big, big bands. And then they're like, you're never going to make money being a musician. You know, you have to go to sea and work on ships and get a real job. And that really probably, you know, put a stop on that. So maybe yeah. I need to shift some well, of there that. There we go. Maybe we had a bit of a realisation here today. Thank you. <laughs> no Thank problem. You. We're doing breakthrough. Breakthrough session. Breakthroughs Break with Maritza. Things you can't in here. Yeah. Now, one last question I ask everyone at the end of our podcast episodes or conversations, I like to call them, is what is something that you heard once that you could not unhear and that sparked positive changes within you. Oh, my God. And it can be right at the beginning of your journey or it could be yesterday. So something I heard recently, and it's become a a focus of study of mine, 
and I'll say it in Sanskrit first. It's Om Trayambakam Yajamahe Sukantem Pushtivaranam Urva Ruganiva Bandhanam Riksho Mukshiyam Ambritat. Impressive. And what it means is, in translation, I pay homage to the inner eye of spiritual insight, which means, you know, I pay homage to this idea that I am spiritual, I am divine. Mm. And it goes on further to say, the source of my compassion, clarity, and fierce determination. And I love that because it's like clarity is like this knowing. Compassion is this care. And fierce determination is this warrior-esque drive to want to bring an idea or this clarity that you have to, to the world. Beautiful. It goes on further to say, I sever my bondage to worldly delusion. And I'm like, <laughs> whoa, oh my God, it's getting deep, you know, because we become deluded by the world. Properties, cars, jealousy, relationships, sex, money. You know, we become deluded. We become, we compare each other. We become so externally motivated and focused that we become so deluded. We become so obsessed. And so it says specifically, I sever my bondage to worldly delusion. <laughs> it's like, whoa. I'm like, where do I sign up? This is like so big. And finally, it says, I liberate myself from the fear of death and rest in my immortal nature. Wow. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? This is like it's freedom. such a big, it's freedom. It's like, yeah. okay, I am divine. I have this clarity, this compassion, this love, and this fierce determination to act on my special skills, who I am, what I have to offer to this world. But then it says, I sever my bondage to worldly delusion. Like, don't get caught up in it, James. Don't yeah. get caught up in it. You know, just like, chill out. Don't get ego, right? Basically, yeah. keep your ego in check. And finally it says... I liberate myself from the fear of death and rest in my immortal nature. This idea that like we are just incarnate and on a small journey to just have this soul experience and then learn the lessons we're here to learn and then go and morph into whatever there is next. What a beautiful sentiment to embody and mm. something absolutely perfect to end on. And I'm very impressed, I must say, that I didn't even prepare you with that question and no. you came up with such a perfect answer for it. So thank you again for your time today and for sharing yourself so openly with everyone listening. I'm sure there are many, many things people cannot unhear after hearing this conversation and I'm glad you had your own little moment in there about music as well. So thank you for sharing your gifts to the world and being part of this conversation. Thank you Maritza. Thanks for listening to the show. What did you think? And what did you feel? Let us know by leaving me a message on the Things You Can't Unhear Instagram community page. And if you can, give us some ratings love on your favourite listening platform. 